Hello and uh, welcome to <coughs> computer application theory. Um, we are going to deal with uh, some few parts of the theory. We start with the definition. <coughs> As you obviously know, and I've shared my work here. So computer from this, from this definition is an electronic device <coughs> that can perform activities that involve mathematical, logical, and graphical manipulation. We can also define computer as an electronic machine or an electronic machine that receives data, process data, and gives out the output. Now from the definition of the computer, we get the major functions of the computer. One being it receives data, and instructions from the input device <clears throat> to process the data as per the instruction. It will also provide results. It will also provide results for the desired form. That means when you receive the data from the using the input input device, we process them. Then after they are processed by the computer, we get the output. Now, from the functions of the computer application system or the, the functions, the major functions of computer, we get the three major components of a computer system. The first component is input device. The second one is output device. And the third one is the central processing unit. And from the input device, <coughs> we have its function to receive data and instructions from the input device. So the component that receives data and instruction, maybe from the computer user, it is under the input device. Then we have process the data as per instructions, which is under the central processing unit. Then we have it to provide the output, which is made possible by the output device. Now, as you have noticed, we have the three components of the computer system. Number one, we have said we have the input device, we have the output device, and we have the central processing unit. Further, the central processing unit is subdivided into three units. Number one, it, we have the memory unit. Number two, we have the arithmetic logic unit. And uh, number three, we have the control unit. For the memory unit, its function, it is to store files, data for anything that involves storage. The unit that uh, carry out the storage is the memory unit, which is under the central processing unit. Then we have arithmetic and logical function. <coughs> And the arithmetic and logical functions, uh, we can differentiate between the arithmetic from the word arithmetic that involves itself in carrying out mathematical manipulations. And uh, you remember we say, or you know, <coughs> some of these mathematical manipulations are like addition, subtraction, division, all those mathematical manipulations. Then we have the logical unit, majorly the logical unit, it is majorly like we say greater than, less than, all that part. Then we have the functions of the control unit and we say that uh, majorly it control the input and output device. But as we progress, we are going to look into, de into, into detail or into deeper way. Then we'll define the second terminology, I've said that we first defined the first terminology, which was a computer, and we said it's an electronic device that receives data, processes data, and gives out the output. And then I've said that uh, from the definition of a computer system, we get the functions, the three major functions, which are, they are not the only functions of the computer. So I've said we have one to receive data and instruction from the input device. Then we have to process data 
as per the instructions. And then you have to provide the results or the output in a desired form. Uh, then from the function I've said, we have three component of a computer system. And one, what I mean by component, uh, every time you encounter the word component, it is the composition from the word composition that makes something complete. So without these three component, the computer cannot be complete. The first one, the first component I've said, it is the input device. The second one I've said, it's the output device. And the third one I've said, the central processing unit. Then I've said that the central processing unit is further divided into units. And the three major units I've said, we have the memory unit, and then we have the arithmetic logic unit. And finally, we have the control unit. Now, because the central processing unit is a component of a computer system, the functions of its unit qualifies also to be also some of the functions of the computer system. And therefore, from the subdivision of the central processing unit, we further have other functions of the computer system. And the first one I've said it receives data now, process data, provide the result. Then we have the memory, which stores for storage of data files and document. Then we have for carrying out arithmetic and logical functions, and then for controlling input and output device. It is good to note that uh, there is total, there is a, a very huge difference between the, the functions and the advantages. Now, every time we talk about the advantages of something, for you, or the difference between the functions and the advantages, for you to have the advantage, it means there was a function that was carried out. For instance, one of the advantages of a computer system is high speed. Now, for you to determine that uh, that the computer have high speed, it means that they had first received the data, they had processed the data, and also they had given out the output, and to some extent, they had also stored some data. So that's during that processing cycle, or during the receiving, processing, and giving out the output, that's when you are able to determine that the computer have high speed. So... PJD student, they confuse the functions from the advantages. Now, good. Then you permit me to define the second, uh, the second terminology, which is data. And we say that data, or we say data, is a collection of raw facts, figures, and symbols. In other words, these, the, these are the data that don't have meaning. They don't have, the meaning has not been extracted from the, and that's why we are saying is a collection of raw from the word row, facts, figures, and symbols. Now, for instance, uh, when we are dealing with a data, for instance, I will give example of um, the primary and the high school grading. You'll find that a student do different units. Then when the teachers are marking, they feed the data, the marks that the student get. But after the marks have been processed, that's when we are able to obtain another terminology called information. So that data, when it is processed and presented in an organized manner, we call it information. Now, the definition of information, therefore, is it is the data that is processed and presented in an organized manner. So when the data has been processed and presented in an organized manner, it becomes the information. Then we have the third terminology that you are going to define called program. Program. Now, program is a set of instructions that enables a computer to perform a given task. So a program is a set of instructions that enables a computer to perform a given task. I think I will, I will discuss further when we'll be looking at the software. So we'll go to the another subtopic on the advantages of computers. Now, on the advantages of computers, some of the advantages that students write are not correct. For instance, you find some of them writing entertainment, but the truth be said that computer cannot entertain you. It is, it, it is the content that you put in a in a computer that either entertain you or doesn't entertain you. 
So one of the advantage, as I said earlier, it is high speed, high speed. Now on the high speed, it is the ability to perform the task greater than or in a, the task in a speed that is greater than the human being. Every time we are talking advantage of something, it means we are comparing that thing with something else for us to determine that it, this thing is better than this, this one is not better than the other one. So in this case, we'll be comparing computer with human being. And that's why I'm saying that high speed, it is in comparison to human being. So computers have the ability to perform tasks in a greater speed than human being. <clears throat> Number two, we have accuracy. Accuracy. Accuracy, computers are used to perform tasks in a way that ensures accuracy. But it is the accuracy of a computer depends on how you also feed the data. So if you feed the data in a wrong way, you get the wrong answers. But if you feed the computer with the correct data, you get the right or the accurate answer. But in whichever way, either you feed the wrong data or you feed it the wrong with the right data, the computer will give you the accurate, the accurate answer unless it was in a fault. Number three, on the advantages, we have storage. Now on storage, we say computers can store large amount of information. Any item of data or any instruction stored in the memory can be retrieved by the computer in a higher speed. So <clears throat> when the computer stores data, you can be able to retrieve them in future. Initially, or when you compare now computer with the file system, the file system in this case, I mean, with the paperwork, it means that retrieving of data stored in a computer is more faster than uh, retrieving of data stored in files or in paper, in paperwork. Number four, we have automation. Automation says the computers can be instructed to perform complex tasks automatically. For instance, you have uh, these high school bells, which are lot automated after maybe a certain time they go on or they ring. You find uh, because of computers, initially they, they used to ring, I think uh, a bell that used to be rung by a person uh, shaking the, the bell or whichever thing that was being used. <clears throat> but by automation, they are able to perform complex tasks automatically. That is another advantage of computer system. Number five, on the advantage, we have diligence. <clears throat> and diligence, I mean, computer can perform same task repeatedly with the same accuracy without getting tired. So if you compare with the, if you compare the computers with a human being, majorly people don't like repeating a lot of things doing the same work with the same accuracy, they get tired. But computers, because of something else that you're going to say on the disadvantages on all on the limitations, we're going to cover that. So number six on the advantage, we have versatility. Versatility, computers are flexible to perform both simple and complex tasks. So if you feed it with one plus one, to give you the answer. If you feed it square root of 0 0.78, it will still give you the answer. So they, they are able to perform, that's what we mean by versatility, able to perform flexible and, uh, or able to perform simple and complex tasks. Number seven, on the advantages, we have cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness. And the discussion of that, computers reduce the amount of paperwork and human effort, therefore, thereby reducing the cost. So you'll find like uh, <clears throat> when you implement or when you implement or when you use computers, for instance, in many institutions or in organizations, because computer is able to do a lot of work, provided the one using it knows how to use it, it will reduce a lot of human effort. 
as in very few people will be employed to do the same work that a computer will do. Thereby, it will reduce the cost for some organizations. Then, so I've said the advantages of the computer. Number one, we have high speed. Number two, we have accuracy. <clears throat> Number three, we have storage. Number four, we have automation. Number five, we have diligence. Number six, we have versatility. And number seven, we have cost effectiveness. And this, these are not the only advantages of computer system. You may encounter another advantages or other advantages, and you're free also to include them in your discussion. Then you can look at the limitation. We can look at the limitation or the disadvantages of a computer system. The disadvantages of computer system. Number one, we have computer need clear and complete instructions to perform a task accurately. If the instructions are not clear and complete, the computer will not produce the required results. So what do you mean by that? If you feed the computers with the wrong information, it will still give you the wrong answer. And therefore, computer is fully dependent on the human being. And therefore that becomes a limitation or a disadvantages to a computer. Then you have computer cannot think. You see, if you're feeding them the wrong, the wrong, if you feed them with the wrong data, if it was human being, they would listen and say this is wrong but for computers they don't think and therefore they just accept the data as fed by the user the other one, computers they cannot learn by experience and on this case i will i will lose a lot of uh, or majorly in most in most cases you find like the computer have been used to teach students for so long but that computer will not do the same work or will not be or we not learn by experience like human being do. You'll use the computer to program a certain program, but in case you want to start another one, it will still need you to feed the data. It doesn't learn. So that's what we mean by computer cannot learn by experience. Again, on the limitation, you're not limited. There are there is a lot of or there are so many limitations of computer system that you are free to also include in your discussion. Then we look at uh, computer classification, and uh, you permit me not to share these notes. On the computer classification, in the computer classification, we say that computers are classified according to several categories. And number one on the category, we have according to generation, then we have according to size, then we have according to purpose and then according to the data they process. So computers are classified into several categories. One, we have according to generation, you have according to size, according to purpose, and according to the data they process. Now, under the categories of computer system, we have types. We have types of computers. So you'll have the categories and in those categories, that is where you have the types of computers. Now, according to the generations, it is sometimes you find a question asking you the, how computers have evolved or how they, they have evolved up to today. So the first generation existed in 1948 to 1956, and it was using a component called vacuum tubes. Some of its characteristics included, they used vacuum tube for circuitry and uh, magnetic drum for memory. They were often enormous, taking up entire room. What do you mean by that? They used to be very big. Uh, then they were very expensive to operate. They consumed great deal of electricity. Those were when the computers were starting uh, or when the first generation, they used to use the magnetic drum for memory, 
they used to consume a lot of electricity they used to occupy a lot of or a big room they consume actually they were so very very difficult to operate then after that i've said that first generation existed between 1940 to 1956 and i will share this note so that at least you can see uh, they existed between uh, I've said they exist between 1940 to 1956. The second generation existed between 1956 to 1963, and the company that they were using, they were using transistors. So transistors replaced the vacuum tube, and uh, ushered in the second generation of computer. Uh, they were also larger in size, uh, as compared to the other generations that uh, came after the second generation. They also required less energy compared to the first generation. And uh, they also emitted a lot of heat. You see, if they are consuming a lot of energy, then it means that uh, the higher rate of consumption, the higher rate of emission. Then we had the third generation, I'm, I'm going over them. The third generation existed between 1964 to 1971, and they were using a component called integrated circuit. Um, you see, they, they replaced the integrated circuit, replaced or what major we call IC, replaced the transistors on the second. As you go down to the current generation, the size continue to, to go down as well as the consumption of the electricity. So as we continue going downward, it, it becomes more advantageous or it becomes more even easy <clears throat> to operate on so the also the we are faster also the the rate of the processing rate also increased how they used to process data also increased then they also used to occupy less space compared to the second generation so as you are coming to the generations as we are going down from the first generation they used to to occupy a bigger room then second generation that generation which are now occupy less space. Then we have the fourth generation that existed between 1971. That is the fourth generation existed between 1941. And they used to use what you call, and uh, I will share different one. They used to, to use very large scale integrated circuit, also abbreviated as VLSI. Then you have the fifth generation that existed between 1980 to present and they use Ultra scale, ultra scale integrated circuit, ULSI or microprocessor. Then after that, uh, I will go to the according to according to size. So I've said that, that the computers are classified according to four categories. The first one is according to generation, then according to size, according to data they process, and then according to their purpose. So now according to size, we have various types of computers. Number one, we have supercomputers, which are big in size and most expensive than any other, classif any other that is classified under the category of size. And majorly also they are used um, in government, specifically use this type of computers for their different calculations and the heavy jobs. Also different industry use them for huge computation for designing their product. Also they are majorly used in Hollywood movies for animation purposes. <clears throat> then you have the second type of, of a computer under the category of size we have mainframe, which are lesser in space or lesser or smaller than uh, supercomputers. Then, uh, before I forget, uh, also supercomputers they are used in weather forecasting. So, on the mainframe computers, I've said they are less compared to less in size compared to supercomputers. They process millions of instructions per second and capable for accessing billions of data. They are majorly used in hospital, airline reservation companies, and many other huge companies. Uh, prefer mainframe because of their capacity to retrie of retrieving data on huge bases. 
they are so expensive compared to to the my, the mini computers then the mini computers they they are less in they are smaller than uh, the my, they are smaller than the mainframe computers uh, they are mostly preferred in small type of businesses personals college etc then you have personal computers majorly abbreviated pc also used uh, majorly preferred for personal and also in small businesses and eg colleges we have notebooks majorly preferred by student therefore i repeat <coughs> I, I, I will keep on repeating. I'm saying that we have computers are classified according to four categories. I've said that the first category is according to size, then according to generation, according to data they process, and then according to their purpose. Then I've said that according to generation, we have five generation. The first generation used to use vacuum tube, the second generation transistors, the third generation used integrated circuit, and the fourth generation used, uh, they used to use a very large scale integrated circuit. Then we have the fifth generation that used ultra scale integrated circuit, all also called microprocessor. Then I've said that under the size, we have supercomputers, we have mainframe computers, we have mini computers, and we have personal computers and finally we have notebook but uh, there are others that you find like macro computers in your own research uh, you are not limited to what i'm discussing here today then we have according to data the process we have the first one called analog computers then we have digital computers and we have hybrid computers we start with the discussion of the first, the first, the first type under this category, which is, and I'm sharing my notes so that you can see, we have called the analog computers. This is a form of computer that uses the, or that process the data continuously. So for analog, they process the data continuously. Uh, then for the digital computer they process the data in a discrete manner then for the hybrid computers they exhibit both the properties of the analog and the properties of the hybrid what i mean by that when when we what we talk when we talk about the continuous aspect of physical phenomena it is like you continue from the lower going to the top but for discrete, that is for digital, you process in a discrete manner. So you are processing differently, but combining them later. So then for the hybrid computers, it combines both properties of the analog and the digital computer. So I will repeat, I've said we have com computers are classified according to four categories. The first one I've said is according to generation. The third one I've said, the second one I've said is according to size. The third I've said is according to the data they process. Then you have the fourth one is according to their purpose. Now, according to their purpose, we have three types of computers. Number one, we have special purpose computers. Then you have general purpose computers. And then you have dedicated computers. Now, what do you mean by special purpose computers? The special purpose computers, they are generally designed for particular work or job. Majorly, it can either be single or multi-related task. So they are majorly for a specific task. Now, from the definition of a computer, we say that a computer is an electronic device that receives data, processes data, and gives out the output. Now, you'll find there are majorly some people confused that the computers are the only one that we, the, the computer that we know, and I quote, but anything that is electronic that receives data, process those data and gives out the output qualifies to be a computer. For instance, an ATM machine. You see, an ATM machine is a special purpose computer. You cannot stand in a, and I normally use this illustration, you cannot stand in a ATM machine to print cards, to print wedding cards, to print, 
things. There is that specific purpose for that. And the specific purpose can either be singular or can either be multiple or multi-related task. For that, what I mean by singular or multi-related task, it is you can go to an ATM machine and decide to just withdraw the cash without even checking the balance. But you can go, that is a single task. You can go to the, to the ATM machine, you decide to check the balance, to withdraw. So those are more than one task. That's why I mean, well, that's why I'm saying that for a special purpose, they are specifically for a specific purpose for a specific purpose. So it can either be a singular or can either be a multi-related task. Then we have general purpose computers. The general computer, the general purpose computers are computers that are designed for the general purpose of the computer system. They, they do the general purpose, the general purpose, the typing, the general purpose of a computer system. Then you have dedicated computers. Now, dedicated computers, these are computers that are general purpose in nature, but have been dedicated to do specific tasks. For instance, you'll find, and I will give, because this is an introduction to computer, it is not a detailed part of it, it's introduction to computer. I'll give example of, uh, of the computer cybers. If I the man operating or the woman operating in a cyber, they have a specific computer in which they are able to, to control the functionality of their cyber. Now, once you are done with the, using your computer in a place that you will be seated in a cyber, the cyber attendant will just tell you, this is the amount of money that you have used and you just pay. That is a general purpose computer that have been designed to do a specific task. And that's what we are calling dedicated computers. So I also give illustrations of uh, dedicated computers uh, with our concept of uh, Christianity, Muslim, and any other religion. Like, like, let me use Christian. You find, and I quote, some of us are Christian, but there are those that are dedicated to certain roles. So when you talk about dedicated computers, there are those computers that are general in nature, general purpose in nature, but have been dedicated to perform specific tasks. Now, after that, uh, I will skip to anatomy of computer system, anatomy but before I get to anatomy of computer system, I, I will have to, I will have to repeat what I've said. I say that from the definition, we say that computer is an electronic device that receives data, process data, and gives out the output. Then we define another terminology called data. We say that data is a raw fact, figure, and a table. Then we defined another term called information and we said information is a processed data that is presented in an organized manner. Then after that, we looked at the, the functions of the computer system. The first one I said, it is to receive data, process data. It is to receive data and instructions. That is the first, the first function. The second function is to process data and, and the third one is to give out the output. But you remember I said that when we subdivide the central processing unit, we have three more units, memory. So the function of the memory also qualified to be the function of a computer system. And I have said that, so therefore, the functions of the, the computer are, number one, it is to receive data and instruction, to process data and instructions, to give out the output about the processed data, then for storage of data, files and document. Then for carrying out arithmetic and logical functions and also for controlling input and output device. Now, from the three major functions that is receive data, process data and gives up the output, we get the functions of computer system. That is the component only the component of a computer system. Number one component, it is the input device. Number two, it is the output device. Number three, it is the central 
processing unit. Then central processing unit is subdivided into three units. Number one, we have memory unit. We have arithmetic logic unit, abbreviated as ALU. And number three, we have control unit, control unit. So after that, I've said that we have computer classification and we say that computers are classified according to four categories. Number one, according to their generation. Number two, according to their purpose. Number three, according to, your, to their size. And number four, according to the data they process. And I've said that uh, under the generation, we have five generations. The first one used to use the vacuum tubes. The second one used to use transistors. The third one used to use integrated circuit. The fourth one used to use very large scale integrated circuit. And the fifth, which is currently, even to date, use ultra scale integrated circuit, ultra -scale integrated circuit or also called microprocessor. And in other words, silicon chip. Then according to the size, we have supercomputers. Then we have mainframe computers, we have mini computers, and then we have personal computers, and you have notebook. Then according to their purpose, we have general purpose computers, we have specified computers, and we have dedicated computers. Then according to the data they processed, we have analog computers, we have digital computers, and we have and we have hybrid computers and the discussions I gave there before. Now, so for now, I will look at the anatomy of computer system. When I talk about anatomy of a computer system is how information flow from one component to the, from the first component to the last component. And as you well know, we first receives data through the input device and uh, it is here in my, in my diagram. This is the diagram for anatomy of a computer system. So the first thing is that it receives data or it receives data through the input device. Then once that data is received, it is taken to the central processing unit, which I said the earlier that has three units, memory unit, we have arithmetic unit and you have control unit. Then after the information have been processed in the central processing unit, it is taken to the output device for display. Now, in the beginning, you remember I said that if one of these component is not there, like the input device, the central processing unit, and the output device, the computer system will not be complete. Now, if, for instance, you take, you extract input device from the components of a computer system, you'll not be able to receive data. If you take out the central processing unit, you'll not be able to store, to process this data. If you take out the output device, you'll not be able to display. So therefore, this computer system becomes complete when all these three components are there. That is the input device, the central processing unit, and the output device. Then we have the discussion here, the unit, then you have the functions. Now, as I said earlier also, for the input device, we say that it receives data and instruction. Here it says, reads information from the input media and enter the computer. So majorly in a, in a clear way, the functions of the input device, it is to receive data and instruction into a computer system. Then the central process unit in ISEMA, it is subdivided into three units, that is memory unit, arithmetic unit, and the control unit. So we have those program and data, perform arithmetic and logical functions, then for the control unit, interpret program instruction and control input and output device. Then output device, it decodes information or it gives out the, the output about the process data. That's why it says decodes the information and present it to the user. So after that, uh, we look at uh, these are the examples of the input device. Examples of input device, we have keyboard, we have mouse, barcode. Then examples of output device, we have terminator, stock monitor, we have printers. So anything that helps you to display the information qualifies to be an output device. We have, now on the memory, 
I will not look at that much for today, but I'll try and look at it next time. So I want us to go to the application softwares and operating system. Application softwares and operating system. Application softwares and operating system. In a minute I get there. So when you talk about softwares, we, we remember we I defined I defined program and I said it's a set of instruction in the first and I said I'm going to look at it and you're going to look at it here. Um, hmm. Going to look at it here. I want to get to where so that I share these notes. Good, I'm sharing them now so that we see them. <coughs> Good. Then when you talk about softwares, when you talk about software, a software is a collection of computer program that provide the instruction telling a computer what to do. So when you talk about a software, software and a program, a software is a collection of program, but a program is a set of instruction. And you see some of these people who do programming uh unfortunately for this class we are just covering the introduction to computer application which is the general for everybody who want to use the computer just the general information but we still get into practicals in the next lesson uh, so for the software is a collection of computer program that provide instruction telling a computer on what to do. You see, you can write a program to instruct your computer on a certain things. Like for instance, those people who do C programming, they're able to write a program to calculate a certain, a certain computation of mathematics or something. So in other words, you are just instructing a computer on a specific, on a specific task to carry. So I will, I will try to discuss several types of software. Number one, I will discuss application software. Number two, I will discuss system software. Then I will discuss programming languages. And these, they are not the only softwares. We have other softwares here, utility software. We have shell software, we have editor, we have database management system as also a type of software. So in this case, I will first concentrate on the three softwares, that is application softwares the system software and the programming language. So on the application software, uh, every time you hear the word application, an application is for a specific, an application is for a specific task, either singular as again, or multi-related specific task. Like for instance, when you look at software, like a Bible software, it is for a specific task. When you look at the WhatsApp, it's for a specific task. So a software, when you talk about application software, majorly it is designed to meet the requirement of the user, some of them, of course, not all of them. And they are either singular or multi-related specific tasks. That's an application software. Then when you have, we talk about system software, these are software that are used to run for running of the entire system of a computer. And majorly those, they, that's where the operating system falls in. And we are going to look at the operating system in the next subtopic. So when you talk about the system software is a program which helps in running the computer system. So if a system software is used to partly manage the computer system, e.g. memory, processor, then it is referred to as utility. So utility software falls under the system software. So if it is used to run specific computer system, like memory, processor, it is called utility software. So I've said that application software, it is, for performing singular or multi-related specific task, and majorly it is designed to meet the requirement of a user. Then you have system softwares, and I've said the system softwares they are used to run the computer system. And if 
they are used to run partly or to partly manage a computer system, e.g. memory processor, they are, also, they are referred to as the utility softwares. Then I said that I'm going to discuss programming languages. When you talk about programming languages, for instance, we have C++, we have C, we have Java, Basic, Pascal, we have Oracle, all those, all those programming languages. Majorly, there are grammatical rules for instructing a computer to perform specific tasks. So majorly, when you hear about the Java, the PHP, they are just grammatical rules for instructing a computer to perform specific task. And I said, as I said earlier, this class is just for introduction of computer application. Uh, so I will just give the general information about the computers because that's what uh, it's required. Then under the programming languages, we have four types of programming languages. Number one, we have the machine language. The machine language uh, only accepts numbers and that is one and zero. Then we have assembly language. Assembly language replace the numbers for name. So instead of now using the numbers, we use the name. Then you have high level language. The high level language concentrate on the problem being solved rather than the machine architecture. So when we say, when we talk about the high level language, that's where we have the C and C++, they majorly concentrate on the problem rather than the machine architecture. What I mean by that, like for instance, for those people who use scientific calculators, if you feed a calculator with a certain value, you are not concerned on, on how it solved that or how it will get to the answer. You have only concentration at it carries, for instance, if, it, if you feed it with two plus two, you are only concerned with it getting the two plus two, but how, not how it is it gets the two plus two. Then we have the last one. We have the fourth generation language. The fourth generation language is more closer to human being uh, than the high level language. And in this case, to my understanding, I will take for instance, the robots, the AIs, all those things, they are qualified to be the fourth generation language. Then I will look at another term that I said earlier that I'm going to look at called operating system. Now I've said that a software is a collection of program and instruction. That is the programs and the related data that instruct a computer on what to do. And I say that we have, I was to discuss or have discussed three major types of softwares. I've talked about the application softwares. I've also talked about the system softwares as well. I've talked about the programming languages. And when I was discussing the system softwares, I see that system softwares are the softwares that run the computer system. And I've said, if the software is used to partly manage the computer system, e.g. the processor and the memory, it qualifies to be the utility software. And I remember I mentioned that under that type, we have operating system like Windows 7, Windows 8, 8.1, Windows 10. Uh, we have uh, Kali Linux. They fall under the operating systems. So the definition of operating system we say it's a software consisting of program and data that runs on a computer and manages the computer hardware, resources, and provide common services for efficient execution of various application softwares. So in other words, it provides the interface, the interface of interaction between, that is the interface between the computer and the computer system. What I mean by interface is that point of interaction between the computer and the, comp the computer user. So majorly the computer systems, that is the operating system, sorry, they provide the interface between the user, the computer user and the computer system. The interface I've said is that point of interaction between you, the user of a computer system and the computer system itself. <clears throat> then I will look at the characteristics of a good operating system. The first one we have concurrency and I will share this note now. I will share these notes. I've said the first one is concurrency. <clears throat> what I mean by concurrency, it is the existence of several, several simultaneous activities. For instance, 
like now the phones that we use because also phone qualify to be a computer because i say that the computer is an electronic device that receives data process data and gives us the output some of the computers you're able to receive a call as you text as you receive a file maybe you are transferring a music somehow you're able to receive so that's what you mean having simultaneous activity or parallel activity that ability of an operating system to permit you to do that qualifies to be a good operating system or characteristic of a good operating system. And in this type, we call it concurrency. Then you have sharing. When you talk about sharing, as a, and in this case, I will be in most cases ref, be referring to our phones because majorly we interact with phones more than the, the big computers in quote. So when you talk about sharing, a good operating system should be able to permit sharing of resources. When you talk about resources, resources is either data, files, documents, all those things, they fall under the category of resource. Equipment such as printers, they are also falling under the category of resource. So a good operating system should permit sharing of resources or equipment. Number two, we have efficiency. The efficiency, we say, this is measured in terms of the way an operating system uses the available resources against the output. So for instance, in your phone, for a good operating system should be able to determine that the available resource will be efficient for the expected results. For instance, you can have a phone that has a less space available or memory available, if your operating system is not in good condition to determine that the available space or the available memory is not enough, then doesn't qualify to be a good operating system. And that's why we are talking about efficiency. So efficiency is measured in terms of how you are able to use the available resources against the expected output. Then we have the fourth point called the deterministic. So a good operating system should be deterministic in the sense that the same program running in different times with the same data should produce the same results. So what I mean by that, you can have the available resources at, or at your disposal today, you use them. So the results that you get should be nearly the same or the same using the same resources in a later date. So that's what we are talking about, deterministic. Then you have reliability. Reliability, a good operating system should be free of errors and be able to handle contingencies. So the, the, the other point you have maintainability, it should be possible to maintain with ease through enhancing it and correcting any error. Then I'll be very fast, we look at the functions of operating system. The first one, from the characteristics is resource sharing. Then you have provision of user interface, and I'm sharing this note here. Provision of user interface, and I say that the user interface is the point of interaction between the computer and the user. That point where you are able to interact with the computer for you to be permitted to, to use the computer. That's what we are talking about, the user interface. Then you have job sequencing. Some of you who have used Sender or the Flash here will bear me witness that at one point when you are using that, it was able to tell you that this job has finished transferred, the other one is queuing, or there is a memory error or a transfer error. So that is a function of operating system. It tells you it is able to prioritize jobs or to maybe using the five first in, first out, the job. So it is able to sequence job. The other one is just to handle errors. What do you mean by handling errors? So majorly, when, I, when an operating system is handling errors, it detects an error, tries to solve that error, it gives the, the feedback to the user. So what a good operating system should be able to determine when there is an, there is an error. Then as it try to solve, it gives the information to the, to the user. 
So when you talk about error handling, and I uh, read the, the notes here, operating system detect an error in a computer and then report them to the user while also tries to correct them. It will communicate to the user mostly through error messages. Like for instance, if you're transferring a file and there is no enough space, a good operating system should tell you that the available space is not enough for what you are transferring. That's when you talk about, that's when you know that uh, that operating system is good. And as I said earlier, I'm getting to give you the general information about this as you go on. And then the other last function of a computer system as per these notes, it is to input and output handling. It manages all the input and output devices by enabling them to function as they should. They also enable them to be able to communicate with other parts of the computers. So you'll find um, that all the input device and the output device, they are all directed to the central processing unit where the operating system is installed. So from the installation of operating system, that is where we handle the input and output. So if they are not connected, like for instance, if you are not, if the, if the input device is not connected to the central processing unit where the operating system is, you not be able to handle or you not be able to receive, to receive the, the data into a computer. Then you'll permit me to look at the types of operating system being the last thing that I'm going to look today. The types, when you talk about the types of operating system, and of course not limited to this, we classify them according to task, according to time, uh, and uh, some few as we look. The first one is the real-time operating system. That's the first type of operating system. Then you have multi-user operating system. We have single-user operating system. We have single-tasking operating system. We have multitasking operating system, and we have distributed operating system. Now, for the real-time operating system, it's a kind of real, it's a kind of operating system where the feedback are instant. So you instantly get the feedback. Then for multi-user operating system is an operating system that permit multiple users at a, at a specific time. Then you have single user operating system. It permits one user at a specific time. Then single tasking operating system, it permits execution of one task at a given or at a specific time. Then we have multitasking operating system permits execution of different or multiple tasks at a given time. Then you have distributed operating system, deep distributed operating system, the operating system that are geographically distributed and appears to be like, or they appear to be the same. So they are geographically distributed, but they are the same. So uh, uh, for today, I will reach to that point, but uh, I will remind us where we started. We started somewhere and we started on this. We said the definition that uh, the computer application, we are majorly dealing with the, the introduction. The, this is the introduction to computer application as we get in getting deeper. So we started the definition on some few terminologies. Number one, we defined the computer and we said, computer is an electronic device that receives data, process data and gives out the output. Then you defined data. We say that data is raw facts, figure and tables. All and, or, uh, information that is an um, information that doesn't have meaning to the user. Then we defined information and we say information the process data presented to the user in an organized manner. Then after that, we talked about the functions of the operate, the functions of the computer system, sorry. And we say that the functions of computer system we have receives data and instruction, process data, gives us the output, storage of data files and document, carrying out arithmetic and logical functions. And I said that arithmetic all the mathematical manipulations such as addition, subtraction. Then you have logical that is greater than, less than false or true. Then also controlling input and output device. Then you talked about the advantages of computer system. We say the first one is high speed. We have accuracy. 
we have versatility, we have diligence, cost effective, re reliable. Then we talked about the disadvantages into bracket limitation of computer system. And you say the first one, they don't think, they don't learn by experience. They require clear and complete instructions. And if the instructions are not clear, they do not produce the desired results. Then we talked about the component of computer system. And we said that component of computer system are three. We have input device, we have output device, and we have the central processing unit. Then the central processing unit, we say it is subdivided into three. We have memory unit, we have arithmetic logic unit, and we have the control unit. The function of memory unit is for storage of data files and document. The function of arithmetic unit is for carrying out arithmetic and logical function. Then the function of control unit, it is for controlling input and output device. Then we looked at the anatomy of computer system and we say the anatomy of a computer system is how data flows or the how, how the component of a computer system are interconnected or how the data flows from input device to the central processing unit, then from the central processing unit to the output device. Then after that, we have looked at the application softwares and uh, operating system and we said, software is a collection of program and related data that instruct a computer on what to do. And then you have looked at the three major types of softwares. You have looked at the application softwares and we say that application softwares, they are software that are designed to be for specific, singular or multi-related task. And as I said earlier, they are used, they are majorly designed to meet the requirement of a user. Then you talked about the system softwares and I said the system softwares are the softwares that run a computer system. And therefore, I also say that if a software used, is used to partly manage, it is used to partly manage uh, a computer system such as memory or a processor qualifies to be utility software. Then we have, we talked about the programming languages and we say that programming languages are grammatical rules that uh, instruct uh, a computer on what to do. And we looked at one was machine language that understand numbers only, that is one and zero. Then we have assembly language that represses numbers for names. Then we have high level language that concentrate on the problem being solved, but rather than the machine architecture, then we have the fourth generation language. The fourth generation language I said is a language closer to human being than the high level language. Then you remember, we also looked at the computer classification and we said computers are classified into four categories. One, number one, we have according to generation, then according to their size, according to their purpose and according to the data they process. According to generation, I've said we have five generation. The first generation I said used to use uh, the vacuum tube. The second used to use the transistors as a component. The third used to use integrated circuit. The, third, the fourth used to use very large scale integrated circuit. And the fifth used ultra scale integrated circuit, microprocessor or silicon chip. Then according to size, we have supercomputers. We have mainframe computers. We have mini computers. We have personal computers and we have notebook. Then according to their purpose, we have specified computers. We have general purpose computers and we have dedicated computers. Then according to the data they process, we have analog computers, we have digital computers and we have hybrid computers. Then you have looked at the operating system <clears throat> and the operating system we have given us, we have given a, a definition of operating system and we have said operating system is a set of instruction. And I will read that um, operating system we have said, uh, operating system we have said is a sequence of instruction written to perform specific task for a computer. And that's the point I say that a, a, a program that is the operating system, the operating system, sorry, I said is a software consisting of program and data that runs on a computer and manages the computer hardware and provide the user with an interface that he can easily work with. So that's where 
I say that majorly when you talk about operating system, we have said that operating system is that point of interaction between the computer system and the user of the computer. So if I progress, then we have looked at the characteristics of a good operating system. And you have said that one, one, we have concurrency, we have sharing, we have efficiency, deterministic, we have reliable. Then on the function, you have said the first function is for resource sharing, error handling, input handling, job sequencing, that is input and output handling and a handling. Then you have looked at the types of operating system. We have real time operating system. We have multi use operating system, single use operating system. We have single tasking operating system, multitasking operating system, and we have distributed operating system. So uh, for today, I will cover that. But uh, as we progress, I'll be looking at the practical We'll start with the the uh, the packages. That is introduction. That is Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint. As we progress that way, but of course we'll also be looking at other programming languages. Uh, one of them we'll also look at uh, SQL, but not all of them. So thank you. Uh, I wish that you. I pray and I hope that you have you have understood something through that uh, through that uh, coverage that you have covered today. So have a wonderful time. God bless you. Thank you.